London Calling YouTube, London Calling everyone, and in this uh, week of the Red Moon, prophesied by scripture, I gather, um, I think the world is supposed to have um, ended by now. Um, so, uh, Gunderson, how was your apocalypse? It were right, good and lad. Hey, and uh, Phil, how was the apocalypse for you? The Jedi's attempt on my life has left me scarred and deformed, but my resolve has never been stronger. Excellent. Okay. Well, good to know that you're up for the show, despite I... having been lost by the sound of it. <laughs> um, so, um, Gunderson and Vil, the voices you just heard, are new guests. So, um, Gunderson, why don't you tell us something about yourself? Uh... Um, well, um, I make, I, I, I have a lot of ideas for videos that I never make because I'm very limited in my, uh, video editing resources. That's all I can think of. Ah, I know the feeling. And, um, Bill, a little something about yourself? Oh, God. My mother, she threw me down the stairs and threw a pan of hot grease all over my chest and neck and ass. I can't walk anywhere, and I've got awful piles and bunions on my feet. Oh, God. Uh, that that sounds truly harrowing. I have no idea. <laughs> uh, now, what? on a serious note, um, I, I don't know. They They still haven't put the net back over my head and put me back in my cage, so make of it what you will. Okay. Well, we're off to an interesting start, and um, I, I, I think, I, I, Bill, I think you've heard this show before, and you're trying to out-crazy Milan, which is quite something. <laughs> um, I, I dread to think what it would be like to have you and Milan on the same show. This, this combination may be bad for the universe. <laughs> uh, but, um, right, um, some of you out there may be aware that a topic that we discussed last week, um, a a trans love song in music video form from Thailand, which um, went viral, um, is debatably not as progressive as, as one might hope. Now, when we watched uh, that video, uh, everybody but me was only watching it just before we hit record. Um, and uh, I hadn't seen it with captions before. There was an article. It'll be linked in the description yet again. Um, and we cut a lot of slack for Thai culture, because none of us were particularly familiar with, with Thailand. Um, and I will agree that there were some problematical things which we didn't really address. Um, also, I don't know exactly how well translated it was. But you've got, um, it is a moving love story. It does, it does um, uh, you know, increase um, transgender visibility. It did address the problem of violence against uh, trans people. But you still get words um, such as ladyboy. Um, and the main thing, that I think, for me was the assumption that the song makes that the audience would be familiar with the stereotype that transgender women uh, are permissive and will, and will cheat on you, that they're not, they're not faithful, which we don't really have as a stereotype for trans people in the UK. I'd say it's bisexuals who, are, uh, who get that stereotype. Um, and I think the argument, there was a video response from you, James, 1978, and his video will also be linked in the description. Um, and um, I think it comes down to, and I've had this sort of conversation with James before, whether about things that I like um, as, you know, an LGBTQ individual myself, um, that vis visibility is uh, better than invisibility. Sorry. Sorry. That's okay. Even if it's not perfect. And I think... Ultimately, for me, every journey starts with but a single step. Um, as, a teen, as a bisexual teenager, I watched a show called This Life. And I even saw an article recently on why This Life was great in the 90s and why it's shite now. Now, the reality is that it did feature gay characters and it was very open about sexuality. And it featured a bisexual character who got shit even from a gay person. Um, especially from a gay person who pretty much didn't think that bisexuals existed or just in denial. Um, and I followed what the third E character went through in the couple of years that show was on. Um, I was dismayed in the 10th anniversary um, uh, special, a uh, reunion special, because in the first scene there was a funeral. Guess what? It's Ferdy's funeral. 
Are they going to say he died of an STD? Oh, yes, they are. And a bit of a stab in the back, if you were a bisexual who was watching this oh-so-progressive show back in the 90s for 30. Um, but I would argue that, yes, it, it's not as great when you look back. If we hadn't had this life, though, uh, would Channel 4 have commissioned Queer as Folk? Would there, and, and hence there, there, there then being uh, a Queer as Folk USA, um, which may, in fact, have led to the L word being greenlighted, um, and we're at the point we are now. Um, and we were very hard uh, when it comes to trans issues when it, um, on Dallas Buyers Club. But Dallas Buyers Club is Hollywood. It has a much higher profile than a Thai music video, at least in the West. Also, I felt as a Western film depic- depicting a trans character, Dallas Buyers Club didn't just fail to be progressive. I felt it was a bit backward. Um, but um, that's my attempt at, uh, at addressing uh, the criticism of the video and the coverage that we gave it. Um, if anyone has any opinions, please, please put them in the... Uh, uh, yeah, I can't speak today. In the description. What I will um, say, so as to throw it open to the floor, is um, would you um, agree with me, uh, starting with Gunderson, because I like to be um, alphabetical, that... Sometimes um, even imperfect visibility is better than not having visibility at all, and that you just have to accept that that sort of progress takes place kind of slowly, you know? Well, the thing is, I don't really know what the visibility of trans people already is in Thailand. I'm guessing from all this that it's not the visibility is somewhat lacking for trans women in particular, in Thailand? Um, well, I suppose they are always uh, seen as, well, they're called ladyboys. They're associated with um, sex work. Um, well, I mean, uh, yeah. well, okay, is, does the term ladyboy exist in Thai, or is that just an English word? I don't know if it's a direct translation of a particular term that they have. Um, but it seems very clear from the video alone that these are the sorts of stereotypes um, which, as I say, we were judging something in, the, in another culture. At least the, the, the video was depicting a character who wasn't permissive. Um, it's even called transgender woman doesn't cheat. But that sort of implies that people are already familiar with, if not accepting, that negative stereotype of being permissive and cheating on your partner. Um, but, but, I mean... Um, but generally, though, I mean, with my point about... Uh, also, I'll, I'll hand it over to, to Bill. What, uh, this could really be said of any social group that's underrepresented. Um, and, you know, um, where I, I, I talked about um, bisexuals in the UK and the progression in, in television throughout my adult life. Um, I mean, what, what do you think? Is it worth accepting, I suppose, compromise? Well, <clears throat> for, first I have to point out that I've not seen the video in particular, My only understanding of anything to do with, you know, Thailand and by and the transgenders really kind of backs up part of what you were saying, because I honestly thought that it must be a huge open thing over there because, oh, my God, if you're surfing the net, you know, you get bombarded with porn ads. And every time that you see a porn ad come up that has trans people, and even if you're not looking for that and I'm not it pops up because I'll sometimes go to other things and everything trans that ever pops up is Thailand. Mm. And keep in mind, this is from somebody who doesn't specifically look for that because that's just not where my interests are. I'm not knocking it for people that are. Mm. And if it's coming up for somebody that doesn't look for it and it's always Thailand, it makes it look like it's a big open thing there. But for me to know if it really is, because let's face it, if you judge the world through the lens of porn, you have a problem. (laughs) Um, I would have to go to Thailand or know people from there with whom I could speak freely about it, and I don't. Um, Overall, on the whole issue, um, see, I'm very much, I don't know how familiar you are with American politics, but I'm a libertarian, and I very much think that the more that we get the government the hell out of things and the more that we stop making an issue of them and just let people live their lives the better off that will be. I I don't think that it really matters what I think or you think or the next person does about someone being gay, bi, or whatever. 
as long as they're not harming anyone else, it's really not my place to tell them how to live their life. And if we all had that attitude, we'd have a lot less problems. Well, I mean, um, it's also... It, yeah, it is something quite strongly associated with Thailand because, I mean, if I even if you even say the word Thailand, that's one of the, probably one of the first things that comes to mind for a lot of people is, well, you know, trans female sex workers, which mm. is like there's I remember seeing it's like a parody of the um, Rosetta Stone ads that it has like the usual I'm learning Russian so I can communicate with my my auntie or whatever. And at the bottom, there's a guy with a shocked expression on his face saying, I'm learning Thai, so I can go to Thailand for a thing. <laughs> right. So okay. that that's the kind of stuff. So, yeah, it is quite strongly associated with um, with Thailand yeah. in, in the West, I suppose. But, yeah, I, I just, I guess I don't know how well perceived and how well represented Thai pe- uh, 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 trans people are in Thai culture in general so I can't really say whether this is uh, like well, progressive yeah. as, as you James pointed out in the video and as was briefly touched upon last week in those uh, East Asian and Southeast Asian cultures uh, because they have the tradition of belief in reincarnation it's just kind of accepted so that, uh, that uh, you know, a male soul was accidentally born in a female body or vice versa. So they have that acceptance, but it comes with that understanding. Um, so they've probably been more socially accepted in, in a sense in those countries than in other places because they've got that explanation that kind of clicks for them. Ah, wrong soul, wrong body. Um, um, can I... I thought he said he was just Thailand. I'm not aware of any association with trans people in China, Japan, you know, Korea, etc. There'll be other factors as well, political, cultural, what have you. But um, uh, I don't know if it is partic- if, it, if it is just Thailand. But you see what I'm saying, though, that there's that um, that that that's the religious tradition that those are the beliefs and so. Uh, Maybe someone can tell us in the comment section if Thailand is the exception. But, um, um, okay, uh, any more thoughts on that topic? Uh, I'm trying not, to think. Not, not really, to be honest. You know, I just have I have to stick with what I said, which is that you know if we, and this doesn't just relate to this issue. I mean, I I can put this opinion towards so many different things, but you know, when it comes right down to the sexuality of others, as long as they're not harming anyone else. It's not really my business, and and if we all just kind of took that outlook, oh man, we we wouldn't have to worry about who's more tolerant. It would become a non-issue. It's just like we're stuck living in caves. Okay, um, I guess you mentioned earlier that they um have the belief of reincarnation, therefore it's possible that a male soul was born into a female body or whatever. Well, I mean, I guess I'm wondering why is why is there so much focus on trans uh, women specifically? Like, why are I guess I'm thinking why are trans men so invisible hmm. in Thai culture, or at least from what I can tell, from admittedly a, a, an obviously uh, English perspective. Uh, I suppose because. Um they've been sufficiently recognized in the culture that basically because it's still patriarchal, men uh, quite often, a lot of, enough men uh, fancy trans women. Um, I was going to say, uh, that was why I was thinking it's, it's, yeah. it's a patriarchal culture and therefore yeah. it's, see, it's probably still seen as a man's, like, you know... I guess female sexuality is probably still seen largely as a commodity that yeah. men buy or earn in some way. Um, Phil, uh, when you're typing, could you mute? Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, also, I would say, actually, that generally speaking, I'd say it's also true in the UK and the US that um, uh, trans women get noticed more. Um, well, actually, one thing that Bun brought up is that trans women get transphobia and they get trans misogyny. The idea being 
uh, as Bunn explained it, that they've committed the, the cardinal sin of you know giving up their masculinity. So that maybe that's because that's another factor is that they are um, they're more visible, but also there's a special kind of like double bigotry uh, against trans women for that reason. Yeah, I can certainly see that because they're still perceived. A lot of people still perceive them as men. Mm. So uh, that explains that would explain that. Like that's I would say it's. I mean I, I, I've as a, a bloke who's worn women's clothes myself, I can say that mm. that's certainly something people rip the piss out of you for, especially other cis men yeah um but uh yes and and still something that a lot of people don't understand i mean um transgender specifically uh when i was doing the tags for last week's video i actually mentioned it on facebook i put in the words transgender and trans into the for people who don't know if you do a youtube video you put tags in for the searches and google sometimes completes for you or, or gives you recommendations. And if you put transgender and trans in, it actually suggests uh, drag. Oh, shit. Yeah. Okay, tonight you have been listening to my guests from Yorkshire, Gunderson. Yes, see ya. And from stateside, Bill. See you. Good night, YouTube. Good night, everyone. Um, okay, could we now move on, Gunderson, another follow-up topic from last week. Um, you had some things to say. Pardon me. Yes, we're doing it again, folks. The Russia situation. So, Gunderson, uh, thoughts on Russia? Okay, well, um, I, 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 they did kind of touch on this in, the, um, in last week's episode, that, yes, Russia used to be a big empire, back up up until less than slightly less than a hundred years ago when you know the um well it wasn't the Bolsheviks who overthrew them the Bolsheviks overthrew the government that came, the the interim government that came after after the um the Tsar was overthrown but um yeah basically they did used to be a big empire and the thing is the um I read an article that pointed out that really the only thing the I explain why this is relevant. The only thing that the Bolsheviks and the the whites, the whites being the pro czarist people, had in common was that they were both strongly in favor of maintaining Russian hegemony over Eastern Europe. And the thing is, this is a mentality that largely persists in Russia to this day, that they still want to try and maintain. Russian control over all these places that they used to control and this seems to be well basically what's happened with Crimea seems to be taking the whole thing to its logical conclusion right and um as I and as I pointed out in a comment he's um mm. quite a few things he said in recent times has been a very clear sign of this when he referred to in one statement which was incorrectly translated into English so as not to give this impression where he referred to Ukraine as a part of Russia or mm. referred to Ukraine as this part of Russia or something like that so that shows that he still thinks of Ukraine as ideally at least being part of Russia and also referring to well, he didn't say it outright. He said it, you know, via one of his PR people that Finnish independence was, well, tantamount to treason, essentially. Ah, uh, yes, yes, I saw that. So uh. it's um, this is this all shows that he, the um, so and for this reason, I basically I reckon this isn't just saber rattling i think he genuinely wants to take over these uh a lot of these countries again whether or not he's actually going to bother trying that is yet to be seen obviously but i think he genuinely wants to 
uh, do it for no. Well, there might be other motives as well, like resources well, or whatever. What, but... Yeah. What What strikes me is why now any of the shit he's been doing. Why is he's been president for how long? Why? Why now? He was. Um, I guess because now with all this stuff that's gone on in Ukraine, now is a very, you know, the whole accusing the, the new government of being Nazis thing presents mm. a very convenient excuse to. Well, actually, I don't know why they just did it with U, with Crimea specifically and not the other Russian parts of Ukraine in the in the um the east. Because um also uh. But as I said, ex- uh, I showing, explain some other examples of how the, this mentality has been around for a while. When the Soviet Union was still around, they um, well, the thing is, they 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 did a lot of things that they it was still very Russian centric. Like they invented this concept known as the the Soviet people. You know, there's no so there's no Russians, there's no Ukrainians, there's no Armenians whatever else there's just soviet people but really because most documents official documents and the official language in most of public life was russian it was more or less a byword for trying to get uh non-russian people to speak russian and yeah. um well and they also um tried to settle uh like replace russians but sorry replace the people, the indigenous people of various places with Russians. So, like, Crimea used to be, up until the 1940s, populated predominantly by these people known as uh, Crimean Tatars. They're like, they speak a language that's kind of similar to Turkish. And yeah. Because they're still there from... It used to be... The area used to be controlled by a vassal state of the Ottoman Empire up until the late 18th century... And those people still lived there up until the 1940s, where uh, they were all deported to Uzbekistan, I think, somewhere in Central Asia. And some of them made it back, but they're nowadays they're a minority in Crimea. So they did things like that to try and, well, basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, maintain Russian hegemony even after the collapse. And they also did that with the Caucasus region. Like they, even as far back as the 1920s, they drew up the boundaries so that if the Soviet government lost control over the area, the area would descend into chaos. So that, and then afterwards, Ru- the you know, Russian soldiers would have an excuse to roll in to try and restore order. Which is, a, and that's exactly what happened in the South Ossetia War back in 2008. Mm. You know. Uh, uh, you know, Georgian President Saakashvili decided to attack uh, South Ossetia, and then uh, Putin and Medvedev were like, "Oops, well, guess we got to go in." And you know, as much as we hate to burden ourselves with this task of defending South Ossetia, we've got no choice now. Ah, well, before we move on to the next topic, uh, Bill, do you have anything to say on the subject? Uh, well, my my side of things is all of the stuff that I'm hearing over here. It makes it sound like we have a lot of politicians that want us to basically go and f- wag our dicks in everyone's face like we do throughout most of the world and get involved in something that's really none of our business. I, I don't necessarily like what Putin is doing, but my concern is really more to do with you know, the American side of things and that I feel that we're already involving ourselves in a bunch of wars that we'd be better off never having started really. And I think that sooner or later we're probably going to go in too far and then it's going to become an even bigger clusterfuck than it already is. Uh Aha. Um, okay. So, um, Gunderson, any response to that? I, I, well, I mean, I'm not really sure. I, I, I guess I can understand, and I agree about the um, you know, the war in Iraq, and maybe to a less degree the war in Afghanistan. But I, I, I guess I don't, and you know what we should do in this particular situation, I really don't know. 
I guess I just I'm not completely opposed to the idea of military military intervention in all circumstances, which is what you seem to be like. Yeah. Um, you know, where with what happened in um, Libya, where it basically escalated to the point where if we didn't do anything, then history would look down upon us the same way they looked down upon us for what happened in Rwanda back in 94. Yeah, well, you, fact, you we, know, well, and the thing is, we were already there before it happened, and then we fucked off when everything started going to shit, because just because one Belgian peacekeeper was killed. Yeah, that, that, that's the whole thing, though. I mean, how much can we really play police for the rest of the world? I mean, no matter what we do, nasty things are going to happen. And the problem is, even if we go in with good intentions, at some point, we decide, okay, well, you know, we did this right, so we need to tell these people how to do this, that, and the other thing. And that's why I firmly believe that intervention should be saved for when a side against whom you would want to intervene is very clearly posing a threat to you. And unfortunately, you know, we're not at that point. And I think that if we do go in there, we're going to just create that threat. And the whole thing that's going on there between Russia and, and Ukraine we're not really going to stop that. That's politics that go back, and yeah, the, frankly, they don't really give a damn what we think. So if we get into it, all that we're going to do is end up causing more wars than if we just stay the hell out of it. Mm. That's, I'd say that's an America that, that's had its um, fingers burned. Obviously, in the UK, we're in, uh, we're in Europe, and um, uh, I, I'm not saying I know what the British do, uh, Gunderson, do you think that the threats against um, Finland and Sweden are real, or is that just saber rattling? Mm, I'm not aware of any threats against Sweden, but has he made any threats against Sweden? I don't know if it's explicit. Um, uh, I did link an article on the the last video, but definitely there are there are concerns over Sweden. But basically, I think the implication is that they might the Russia the Russia like, might supposedly want Scandinavian countries as well. Well, uh, it's hard to say, to be honest. I mean, I do, as I said, I think he does want to annex Finland, probably. But whether yeah. or not he's actually going to attempt that, that's... Um, it's hard to say, to be honest. Also, it looks like we're running out of time. OK, tonight you have been listening to my guests from Yorkshire, Gunderson. Yes, see you. And from Stateside, Bill. See you. Good night, YouTube. Good night, everyone. Okay, so next up we have, uh, I'll say, quite a tricky topic, which I'm going, as someone from outside the UK reporting, quite a, well, well, introducing quite a difficult topic. I'm going to try and say it in a nutshell. Forgive me if I, if I stumble. Um, what essentially has happened is that a rancher uh, in the United States uh, with the surname Bundy, I can never say his uh, first name, uh, has, um, well, I've heard two versions of this, because one was that it was some kind of conservation thing, that his cattle were threatening some kind of turtle in the area, and somebody else has said, um, no, uh, it's not about that, um, that, uh, that he actually, his cattle were grazing on federal land, and he hasn't paid the grazing tax since 1998, which would be like 15 years, and apparently that's amassed something like a million uh, dollars worth of tax, he apparently is on the record of saying uh, he doesn't acknowledge the U.S. government exists. Um, when um, the um, feds tried to go in, uh, protesters came, lots of people stood by uh, this Bundy guy. Um, and I think it was, was it the chief police officer in charge said something um, like, um, I hope those protesters have made funeral arrangements, which is a very stupid thing to say. Um, and he's, if he uh, wants an American revolution, let him keep running his mouth. <laughs> um, and uh, basically, well, I, I do think it's a very stupid th way to deal with protesters, apart from anything else. Um, I'll say I'm not American, but there's the First Amendment, and they were exercising their First Amendment rights. Some people are making this also about the Second Amendment, because these people are packing heat. 
and the feds actually did back down and give the guy his cattle back to avoid uh, any kind of bloodshed. Um, and now I must admit, when I first heard this story, uh, the way that it was presented, I was thinking the guy's defending his um, livelihood. I think someone also said there's something like uh, there's oil under the farm and that's what they're really after. Yeah. You do wonder why they put up with it since 1998. Hey, uh, I, now let's give our con- let's give our government here in America a little bit of credit. At least we also do it to our own. <laughs> um, so at first I thought, okay, you know, he's protecting his livelihood in a difficult economy, and these people do see the the state or the government as the uh, as the enemy, um, and it uh, obviously wasn't handled very well. We have to say uh, some of the people who've come out in support of Bundy. Don't seem like the best kind of people. You've got a, a former sheriff said something like what they should have done was use their women, their wives, their daughters as human shields. Because if, they, if it were televised that the feds were shooting uh, their women, then that would, that would cause a revolution overnight. We've had people like saying things like that about, about this story. Um, now, I do want to try and be balanced here, but the way I'm seeing it is I don't, well, I know some people are seeing him as a hero and standing his ground and just protecting his, his livelihood, and that's what the Second Amendment's all about. But the fact of the matter is, I mean, he's, he says he doesn't acknowledge the existence of the government of the country he's in, and he has, and he's, he's owing a million dollars worth of tax, where I don't know anything about this tax, if it's uh, exorbitant or whatever, but I mean, ultimately, if it is public grass that his cattle are grazing on, and um, uh, and I'll say I appreciate. I know that my stakes don't come from the stake fairy, and I'm glad they're free range. But ultimately, he must have known he was meant to pay um, that tax. And um, so I tell you, what, I'm going to go reverse alphabetically this time, because I know that Vil has a lot to say. Um, it, it, people are some people are, are trying to embrace this guy as a hero. Um, I'm having, diff- uh, apart from the fact that I see there's a huge concern that that they won, because that could set a very bad precedent. Well, as- th- that's the whole thing. He didn't really win yet. Uh, one thing that some, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with um, Sheriff uh, Sheriff Mack. He used to be a sheriff in Arizona. He was the one there who defeated the Brady Bill. Yeah, right. one he has a lot of insiders in the federal government, and he's been pointing out and time and again, he says they didn't back down as much as people think. They wanted to appease the protesters and get them out of there because they are planning a raid, and yeah, people are probably going to die. Um, but the right. other thing, as far as what he's saying, I don't know if he actually said that he doesn't believe in the legitimacy of the entire federal government or if he was talking specifically about the Bureau of Land Management, but it is worth noting that the Bureau of Land Management is actually a subcorporation of United States Incorporated, which is actually a private foreign-owned offshore company that's operated since 1952 out of Puerto Rico. It's separate. It, it's really weird politics, but you have the United States federal government and you also have the constitution. You also have the, I don't know why I was saying constitution. You also have the corporation, which is called the United States. And no one in the right mind would recognize the Bureau of Land Management as being lawful governing a lawful governing power because it's not. And if you look at the history of the American West, uh, they have not been against conservation, which is what a lot of people have loved to say, but they have been against people out east who've never even come out west, who don't know the environment there, setting down a bunch of environmental laws that don't work. And this has been an ongoing problem facing a lot of the ranchers out there. Uh, Why Mm -hmm. haven't they gone after him over taxes before? probably because he could win in court that those are not lawful taxes. That's my guess. I'm not saying that as a fact, but I'm saying that based on what bits of information that I do have. I honestly believe, and if evidence shows that I'm wrong, I'd be willing to acknowledge this, but I believe, based on what I know, that the real reason that they're now making a big stink is because they did find out that there's oil down there. But ultimately, this comes right down to the fact that our government has been 
really shutting down a lot of these ranchers. And who owns our government? Come on, everyone knows corporations run our government. That's what fascism is about, is big government and big business working hand in hand. It's not capitalism, it's fascism. And you have these big factory farms coming in here that don't want the competition and who could get much more land to build more factory farms if they didn't have the competition. So I think that what's really going on here is a bunch of greedy big business is trying to push this guy out, and he's certainly not the only one on the list. The very few ranchers that are left are all on that list. Right. right. Okay. 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 Quite an insight there, because I didn't, I didn't know quite what the uh, what the big picture is there. Um, so, um, Gunderson, do you have anything to add? I don't think I. I probably don't know enough about this issue to really comment mm. much on it. But I would say I agree that if he was given that land on the agreement or given that land to graze cattle on the agreement that he pays these taxes, then uh, if he doesn't then do that, then I don't see what's wrong with the, go- with the federal government saying, yeah, okay, stop taking the piss and just, you know, pay pay this money that you owe us. And the thing is, why are they doing it now? Well, I mean, the thing is, I don't know, maybe there are ulterior motives but the thing is, the point is, they are saying it now. Stop, you know, pay these taxes that you were, you've been dodging for the past uh, 16 years. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, if he could contest them in court, well, good luck to him. Why, why didn't he try to contest the, the um, you know, go through legal means if he felt that the taxes were unjust and ultimately, uh, well, I, I'm, if this is still an ongoing story, which I hadn't understood I hope no one's hurt, but um, if the precedent becomes um, that you can say I'm not paying tax and then you win because you're packing heat, um, that's the end of the rule of law uh, in America. And um, do people really want a revolution? Because I'll say that I think this is a, a genuinely worrying story if if people do back down, which doesn't mean I want a raid and for people to be shot dead. Well, you know, an interesting thing on that, you definitely hit some very good points. Um, However, taxation is supposed to come through due representation. So what I think should happen is if he, he should take this to court, absolutely. And if they can determine that this tax is coming from this corporate entity and is not through due and proper representation, then it should be thrown out on its ears. He doesn't know a damn thing. If he does, in fact, fairly owe a tax, and this is determined through the court, you know what? They work with people who have nothing that owe insane amounts in taxes all of the time. Here you've got a guy who's making quite a bit of money and who whose particular livelihood feeds a lot of people there is certainly no reason not to work with him if he'd be willing to pay it but first we do have to determine if the tax is lawfully owned and because i don't have more details than what i've given you i'm not going to say yes it is or no it's not however i definitely think that this whole raiding of his land that's of a theft of his property it's mm-hmm. not the right way for our government to go about it, so I do agree with the people that came armed and ready to fight. That doesn't mean that I necessarily want us to go straight to that avenue, but if they're not willing to say, okay, we need to take a closer look at this issue, then so be it. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's the thing I was about to say. Um, I find it very troubling that their first response was just to go, was to, you know, grab their guns and just gather around him and be like, and... Uh, you know, um, say, okay, we're going to have a standoff if you try and do mm-hmm. this. That, that That is actually the most troubling thing about this story, to be honest. As well as what Alex said, it sets a very bad precedent that, you know, if you, if we kick up enough of a fuss about it, and if we've got, if we've got guns, then, okay, we're going to back down. So, yeah, it, it sets a yeah. very bad precedent. I think I think it's a very petty, childish response to just go in with, like, go in with the, you ain't taking my uh, land. 
<laughs> uh, see, uh, each side in this should have gone through um, legal process. You know, if, can't you take someone to court for not paying their tax, or did he refuse to attend? I mean, because um, obviously the, they've been heavy-handed as well. You've got a threat to kill the protesters when you know they've got guns and you know they're standing their ground, which was pretty stupid. I mean, uh, um, Phil, I remember you saying something like that was a... That was like a declaration of war that kind of said we uh, made made the guy. Uh, was it was it the the chief of police in the area? Or like, Actually, it, it was a commissioner, if I recall what I read correctly, and I'm not looking at it right now. But I'm just going to say off of the t- top of my head that I believe that it was commissioner. And yes, mm-hmm. regardless of whether Bundy is right or wrong, when a guy gets up here and basically declares, "Yeah, well, we're going to kill these protesters." or these protesters deserve to die, as far as I'm concerned, that an elected official is guilty of treason, and he himself should be hanged for treason. As far as I'm concerned, that guy is an enemy combatant of the United States, of the citizens of the United States. And I know that that sounds like a very radical thing to say, but I have a lot to yes. back it up. Uh, well, the U.S., um, when was the last time somebody was executed in the U.S. for treason? Um, I would have to look that one up. I don't know the answer. Um, I do know that treason is actually an executionable crime. Mind you, one should also note that treason is a very specific thing. Sedition is not considered treason. Um, right. However, you know, actually taking a mili- military action against the people of the United States is treason. Taking it against the government is not if the government is acting in a way that is unconstitutional. We actually have a constitutional right and responsibility to overthrow them if they ignore our constitutional rights. And on that, just to explain a little bit, what and a lot of Americans don't understand this too, Our Constitution doesn't actually give the American citizens a single solitary right whatsoever. Um, If you look at the language of the Constitution, it acknowledges that certain rights are universal and not just to American citizens, and that the government is not allowed to take those rights away. So when the government acts in such a way that violates those rights, it in fact goes against its very governing doctrine, um, its very own governing doctrine. That paperwork is nothing more than a set of limitations for the government because it has a very clearly defined purpose. And our federal government has already been acting well outside of it, but that doesn't mean, oh, we should go pick up arms and fight it. But if the government starts doing things like stripping you of your arms, stripping you of what you're allowed to say, removing the freedom of the press, all of which is happening in this country right now, if they can't be stopped, it may get to the point where that becomes the only option. This is a small piece of a much bigger problem in this country of corrupt bureaucrats wanting more and more power and not caring what rights they strip from us. I'm not saying that Bundy's right or wrong, as we've already gone over that, but Mm. clearly the government could have handled this in a much more responsible way than snatching up his property and causing a big stink. And with Mm. the protesters, the fact that they did not fire a shot, I think Mm. that they did the right thing. They were there if it was needed. And had they fired first, I would have been against that. But I, I think that they actually did handle it responsibly. And hopefully now cooler heads will prevail and this will be handled in the courts where it should. Yeah. Okay. Gunson. I'm just going to say I think it needs to progress well beyond this point in order to justify taking up arms against the government, like well beyond just trying to confiscate some random bloke's land from him, whether or not he was in fact evading taxes. I think this is certainly too small an issue to start a gunfight over. Mm. Well, uh, while Bill was saying he'd be against them if they fired the first. Uh, even then, I still don't. I still don't support yeah. retaliating. I think each side in this went straight into macho posturing when you know it should have been handled in the courts to begin with. Um, so it's it's it's. Um, not maybe not the best response from the protesters, but not the the best. Um, what 
don't open it with threatening the lives of protesters, which I can certainly see why people see that as very un-American. <laughs> OK, tonight you have been listening to my guests from Yorkshire, Gunderson. Yes, see you. And from stateside, Bill. See you. Good night, YouTube. Good night, everyone. London calling, YouTube. London calling, everyone. And tonight I'm once again joined by Gunderson. Hello. Oi, oi. <laughs> and Bill. Hello again. Uh, and now we have um, a story linked in the description. This is Eddie Izzard in the Mirror. There have been a few things recently about poverty in, in Britain. And I think uh, the question here is, um, why does or how have we got to the point where the sixth richest country in the world is having to hand out one million food parcels to uh, its poorest citizens? Um, Gunderson? Well, I, th I reckon it's basically because the, um, well, our current government uh, was largely elected on the issue of austerity and promises to cut our cut public spending in order to try and balance the deficit, which is not necessarily bad at face value. But the thing is, it's targeted the welfare state so disproportionately and not um, mm. other things. I mean, it's not like they haven't cut anything else. The military budget's also been cut. But the thing is, it didn't have to target the infrastructure that helps keep poorer people, uh, you know, out of debt and out of homelessness. Uh, but it really has. That's basically been the result, you know, the, uh, you know, with, especially with what's been called the bedroom tax. That's more what the opposition has called it. That's not what it's officially known as. I think the official name is the spare room subsidy or s some shit. But, <laughs> right. but yeah, basically it's, it's a thing where they, um, if you have a certain number of bedrooms, uh, that you don't need, then, and there's a certain criteria for what counts as needing it, then they cut your um, council benefits by a certain amount. If it's one extra bedroom, it's 15%, sorry, 10%. And if it's two, it's 15%, I think. I can't remember exactly. But yeah, basically, it's and it's for people living in... Uh, council houses which is basically uh, I'm not sure what the equivalent would be in America but basically it's a house that working class families live in that's provided for them by the local council until they can afford somewhere better that they actually own mm. and um, basically yeah a lot of people have a lot of people can't afford to pay these to pay the um, the rent because of they've had their benefits slashed, mm. and so because of that, a lot of people can't afford to eat. Sorry, I'm trying to keep it relevant rather than just soapboxing here. Um, yeah, yeah. So because of because um, poorer people are having the welfare they receive cut because. Mm. Uh, they're a bunch of classist cunts, quite frankly. Yeah. Um, then, basically, they can't afford to eat as much. And, um, therefore, they have to rely on food banks and the like in order to be able to yeah. just to live, essentially. Which is very sad, indeed, for, uh, yeah. you know, a developed first world country. Yeah, I, I, I read something that... Um... Boris Johnson's, uh, to explain, Boris Johnson is the mayor of London, um, and once referred to a quarter of a million pound a year salary as quote-unquote chicken feed. Uh, that, that's the mayor of a city in which people are starving, and a quarter of a million, which isn't even all he gets when you consider everything, um, chicken feed. Um, his sister went on some reality show where posh people have to live among the poorest people, where, like, they're literally, I think... Uh, you could be living on or trying to live on like some I can't, I can't remember what ridiculously 
it's more like a family trying to live on a quid a day. And she would normally just a quid, you know, wouldn't even normally buy her a coffee. And I'm sort of thinking, and, and she did change her perspective a lot after uh, being on the show. So I think, why isn't the mayor himself trying to live like this? And yeah, the whole thing can be can be summed up as Tory scum, which obviously for people who don't know, that, that's Boris Johnson to a T is Tory scum, just as David Cameron is Tory scum. So that's that. George Osborne, Tory and scum. George Osborne. Tory scum. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, short answer, Tory scum. Obviously, um, this is a British story, but a universal kind of problem right now, Vil. Um, your perspective? Oh, okay, hold on, hold on. Just one thing before yeah. Vil speaks. I thought, uh, I, I, I remember reading something about someone going on some show to live among the, um, the uh, poor, you know, poor people. Yeah. I, I just I, I thought basic maybe I'm confusing this with something else from due to bad memory, but I thought mm. basically uh, she she um, responded with oh look at the plebs or something. Am I confusing I think, this with something else? I think that might have been her attitude initially. I think she made some insensitive comments about my God they're living like animals. Yeah, this is what I'm thinking of then. Right, but I I think. That may have been sort of taken the wrong way, but she was sympathetic afterwards, is, is, is the point that she did once you tried living on a quid a day. Um, uh, uh, so, yeah, that was my understanding from what I can remember. I could also be suffering from bad memory, but my point would still be, why is it his sister? Get, get the millionaire Boris Johnson to have to live on a quid a day. Um, but, uh, Bill? Uh, just so I can get a bit of perspective, would a quid a day be kind of like the equivalent of someone here trying to live on a dollar a day? A bit more than a dollar. A dollar fifty. Okay. Something. So yeah, same yeah. basic ballpark range then. Mm. Yeah, um, I, I'd have to have heard her, and I, that's the whole thing. I, I don't really pay enough attention to politics over there. I probably should. But it sounds to me like she was trying to say that it's an appalling condition and people took it as her calling them animals. Again, this is me hearing it from the outside. There's not much that I can really contribute to this. Um, okay, well, I mean, um, did you see any that kind of, I mean, because the situation isn't so different in the U.S., is it? Oh, no, you know, we, we've got a lot of stuff like that going on over here all of the time. And, and the thing is, you've this country has... A very far right and a very far left, extreme on both ends. On one hand, you've got one side that wants to basically try socialism and we give everything to everybody and, the you know, the people that make everything have to pay everybody else. And then on the other side of things, you've got these people that think that everybody who is on the dole is there because they're just lazy. And, yeah, there are a lot that are, but that lot that are are still a minority and there's very few I, I shouldn't say that there's very few people that see the, that see the whole picture of this, but there's very few people in a position to make a damn bit of difference that do. So what it really becomes here in this country at the end of the day, and again, I'm speaking only for America because I don't really know how things work there out outside of here, I should say is its political theater to, to get votes. At the end of the day, the fate of all of these people who are starving is nothing more than election fodder. And that's just wrong. Mm. Yeah. And the thing is, it's... Um, sadly, in in the UK, there are a lot of people who agree with these kinds of measures, you know, austerity and whatnot, because they don't understand what it's like to be poor or they think um, as a friend I told to fuck off a few weeks ago said that poor people and, and this is especially fucked up considering he used to be poor himself he used to be as he described poor people in general as dole dossing drug addicts right and he said oh I used to be one myself and I managed to pull my way out of the shitter, so there's no reason everybody else can't. Well, you know, yeah, that's fine. I'm glad it worked for you, but not everybody else has the same abilities that you do. Mm. 
So yeah, and uh, and, and the, the funny thing is he he's also one of those fuck you know fuck actually giving a shit about politics people. Right. He's like, oh, I pay my taxes and that's good enough for me. Right. Great. Anyway, yeah. that's uh, yeah, that's really all I have to say. Yeah, the um, just um, yeah, that's a lot of sadly a lot of people here are have these kinds of classist attitudes. The scapegoating of the poorest people in a time of economic crisis. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, ju- just as people think that there's a lot more foreign aid than there actually is, and just as it's, um, but unfortunately, we we can't. Uh, whether scapegoating is is contrived or whether it just kind of happens naturally, it's always got to be some other. It's got to be some other group that isn't you, um, are causing the problem. Yes. Yeah. Um, and if we're, if we're not careful, um, we'll get another term of, well, maybe not condemn, but another term of, well, Tory scum. Uh, any closing thoughts, Phil? Not really. I've said all that I really can on the issue. Um, okie dokie. Um, shall we move on to the next topic? Sounds I will, good. I will say um, I don't think, I, I'm, not, I'm not entirely convinced that they'll win. But, who, but what is going to happen, I really can't say. I'm quite concerned about UKIP, though. They, that, that is concerning. Uh, it does, yeah. And it's not just the Tories who are losing votes to UKIP. Like, the Labour Party is also losing votes, and I think they're grossly underestimating how mm. how how unpredictable working class, their working class voters are. The impression I got recently was that the Conservatives are definitely losing more votes to UKIP than anybody else, um, which would be great if the, the if the rights are divided. That's great, but sorry, Carol. Well, I mean, yeah, I think you could, sorry, the Tories are probably losing more votes to UKIP than Labour, but the thing is, we can't. It's more dangerous because we expect it from mm. the right wing of the Tory Party. And we um, don't. And the thing is, as I said, with working class Labour voters, it's more it's more dangerous because they're more unpredictable, especially since they fe- largely feel, justifiably or not, like the party's abandoned them. You know, since mm. Tony Blair took over. Yeah, and um, Ed Miliband's basically he has the charisma of a of a you know a damp dishcloth. Yeah, people will vote for Miliband not because he's good, but because everybody else is so crap. I mean, Cameron seems to be losing his marbles. And as for um, Farage and his um, clowning around on Have I Got News For You, and the ridiculous things that they're... Um, some of the candidates they've had have been ludicrous, so ludicrous they've had to get rid of them. The homophobia, and now this nonsense about... Um, Taking the vote away from the unemployed. Did you see that? Nope. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll link you and maybe put the link in the description. Where surely, apart from anything else, UKIP can't look electable. I mean, you'd have to be mad to think that they could form a government anyway. Well, I mean, the thing is, I, 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 it is it's still a concern, certainly, because the thing is, in a constituency near me... Uh, mm. A couple of years ago, there was a, you know, it's still a strong Labour safe seat, but the thing is, they, UKIP got uh, 20, I think it was 1 or 3% of the vote. And in fact, no, and, and also the, um, the, the third highest was the BMP with only 8%, luckily. And that was mm. actually only 0.1% ahead of the fourth one, which was the Respect Party, or, you know, George Galloway's party. So they're also mm. cunts, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Mm. But, yeah, the, um... Basically, they, um... It is a concern, because they're getting quite a lot of votes in by-elections. They're coming, like, second in a lot of by-elections. Especially yeah. in Labour seats. Okay, so that's it for tonight. So, uh, good night from me, Alex, and a good night from Gunderson. 
Good night. And a good night from Ville. Good night. Okay, ta-ta, internets. London calling YouTube, London calling everyone, and once again we are joined by guests Gunderson. Hello. And Ville. Hello. And tonight's topic is uh, Scottish independence... Um, and the idea that they would be independent but still use the pound, even with or without permission. Um, now, this was really only brought to my attention today. Um, my thought on this is um, that David Cameron really, really, you know, wants to keep. He said, you know, he really wants Scotland to stay. And if David Cameron wants that, my advice to the Scottish is, run, bitch, run! <laughs> uh, however... Um, the idea of, and uh, actually one of the articles, which will be linked in the description, points out that two countries um, actually uses the US dollar without permission, which is, um, hang on, is it Ecuador and Panama? Damn it. Yeah, uh, which I didn't actually know. So that's, that's a curious situation. Um, so, uh, Gunderson, um, y- you suggested this story. Um, your thoughts on UK independence, Alex Salmond, and the pound? Scottish independence. Oh, sorry, that's got UK independence, sorry. Scottish independence, carry on. Um, well, basically, I-, I-, I have to say it is kind of mad to say we want to be independent, but, you know, please let us keep the pound. You know, I mean, what you might as well, if you really want to keep the pound that badly, then you might as well just stay as a part of the UK. But, I mean, the thing is, because the, the only alternative is, uh, like, if, either using it without permission, uh. which would result in, wait, basically, your interest rates being set by a foreign country, and mm. it's not a good idea, as Ecuador and Panama have shown with their... Right. Their dubious usage of the US dollar. Um mm-hmm. uh there's they could adopt their new a new currency, but then it would be subject to the inevitable period of instability that all new currencies go through. Or they could try well, I mean the thing is they have to apply and be accepted for EU membership first before they can use the Euro. And Right. Okay. And the thing is, if they don't have a functioning central bank, then they won't be able to use the euro. And and the thing is, but I mean, even aside from this specific story about Alex, from like, you know, this was two months ago now, this story Mm. about Alex Salmond, what do I think about the issue in general? Like the only Mm. real benefits I can see to it, which have been, is that they wouldn't have, the well, I mean, they'd still have the monarchy, which is bet that like the SNP have done that just to appease the monarchists in Scotland, right? But they wouldn't have, you know, they don't have to put up with the House of Lords anymore. Mm. They'd actually have an elected. Well, I don't know if they'd have a unicameral or bicameral legislature, but um, they would potentially have a more constitutional system rather than this ad hoc shite we've got in. The UK, mm. so I can see, poli- poli- like in the way the political system works on paper, I can certainly see benefits to Scottish independence potentially. I don't know if, but I don't know what is actually in the SNP's uh, plan regarding these kinds of things. Mm. And also, the thing is, in terms of as someone brought up, is that they um. They're a bit more socially progressive in Scotland than, well, at least mm. a lot of England is, especially in the South. Like, yeah. And I think one issue that a friend of mine brought up was, uh, I th- ages ago, but was um, apparently something the SNP have promised is to decriminalise pot or something. Mm. Which, yes, I can see um, that maybe the independent Scotland would be more socially progressive than uh, the UK is than if they stayed part of the UK. That's not really something I know a whole lot about, admittedly. But the thing is, um, economics-wise, that's the main reason I think Scottish independence would certainly not be worth... It, it seems like too big a risk, really, to go... Because, I mean, once you go independent, you've got 
to rely on well mostly your own mostly yourself for to sustain you got to be able to sustain yourself economically and the thing is i'm not really convinced they would be able to do it yeah i definitely see what you mean about them being socially um progressive of course let's not forget we only just introduced um same-sex marriage and scotland already had it for quite some time before i don't know quite no, how they long only before. recently introduced the idea was introduced in Scotland before, but not. Mm. It wasn't actually adopted until very recently, until uh, until about a few months ago. Okay, so they only beat us by a little bit. But okay. the thing is, their their bill was more carefully considered than ours. Like it, it was, uh, it was more inclusive of trans people for one thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. Ours was kind of rushed. Um, yeah, well, there, there, there is at least some good news on that, which um, I've actually been meaning to cover, that there is a trans manifesto uh, now, which uh, I'm, I'll try and remember to link that in the description. So hopefully um, trans rights will be uh, or are being considered uh, a lot more. Um, uh, but anyway, sorry, that's a bit off topic. Uh, Bill, um, your thoughts on Scottish independence? Well... That's a really big issue for an outsider, but for me it comes down to I'm, I'm a supporter of anyone seeking independence. Where I draw my bit of confusion is, okay, well, they want to be independent, but they want to shackle themselves to the economy of the United Kingdom from which they're trying to separate. And to me that just doesn't make sense. And then you throw in what's already been pointed out about the problems of other people doing similar and You'd think that they'd take a step back and realize, okay, if we want independence, we're going to have to accept that our economy is going to suck for a while and build up their own central bank, or if not a central bank, at least build up something that they can use. That That's just the harsh reality of it. When when you right. become your own nation, you don't live off of the back of another. Uh. And, the, yeah, that that's just it. I mean, the thing is, if... Um, and the thing is, they they keep I keep hearing about how like they seem to have a, Scottish nationalists seem to have a very overly idealistic idea of how things will be after independence if they do vote for independence. And I don't honestly think they are going to vote for independence because they're still the pro union people are still ahead in the polls. Whether oh. or not that'll still be the case in September is yet to be seen, but. Because basically the only real reason that a lot of Scottish people are considering voting or def or have decided to vote for independence is because of our current Tory government. That's really the main motivating factor behind it. They feel like largely justifiably that these you know, these people are out of touch and don't give a shit about them. And the thing is most Scotland only has one Tory constituency as well and like 47 Labour constituencies. So in that mm. sense, it would also be, wouldn't be very beneficial to us in the rest of the UK either, because then we'd be stuck with, we we they'd only lose, the Tories would only lose one seat, and the Labour Party would mm. lose 47 seats. Which means it would be easy, a lot easier for the Tories to win, uh, win a general election Yeah, there is that shit. We'll have to move to Scotland <laughs> uh, but, or somewhere. But the thing is, uh, yeah, like, I mean, the thing is they get uh, quite a lot. The Scottish government gets quite a lot of money currently from the the exchequer. And the thing is, they wouldn't have that anymore if they left. So, and the thing is, uh, their main sort, their main ideal for revenue post-independence is the um, oil industry. But the thing is, that's actually quite an unpredictable industry, especially in more recent years, and as oil in general on planet Earth dissipates. That's, it's not something that they can rely, rely on, because if, cause if they rely on it too heavily, then their economy could go tits up pretty easily. And then what happens after that? Either they borrow money, which they may not be able to pay back, or they go into austerity. Mm. And the thing is, that's what they've said. Oh, you know, in Scotland, they have 
they, they're promising all these wonderful socialist programs, but if you can't pay for them, then what? Well, oh, they'd probably end up borrowing, wouldn't they? Um, um, sorry, if they can use the pound without permission, why can't they just use the euro without permission until they actually manage to get the euro? Officially? I think... Uh, hmm, that's a good question, actually. I think maybe it's because... Well, I mean, Germany is the main support, the main country holding up the euro at this time. But mm. uh, that's a good question, actually. I really don't know the answer to that. But it certainly wouldn't be a good idea, because, I mean, even using it with permission, Greece hasn't done very well with that. Ah, right. But um, the thing, and another thing they've they've brought up is, like, that they don't really have much influence over what happens in the House of Commons because, well, I mean, Scotland only has nine, a little less than 9% of the UK population and therefore they have almost exactly the same percentage of seats in the House of Commons. It's 59 out of 650. So, um, but the thing is, in that case, they really, um, they... It's kind of the same as any other part of the UK that only has 9% of the population. Like, mm. I mean, one thing I've heard them bitch about is that somehow there's a democratic deficit between Scotland and Westminster, which is, I don't know, I just think it's bullshit, quite honestly, because it's like saying that there was a democratic deficit between the home counties and Westminster when the Labour Party was in power. It's just... You might as well just say, well, the, the the party we don't want is in power. That's not, and that's not a democratic deficit. That's, mm. even if they are a bunch of evil twats, mm. which they are, but, mm. um, so, yeah, that's, I don't know. I mean, I guess the issue is, well, regardless of whether or not it's a democratic deficit, um, we can still do better without them. Yeah. Uh, which, In which case, yeah, I can understand that. But even though I don't agree. But the, th the last thing is, the last thing I want to say is there's definitely, in pretty much the vast majority of cases that I've seen, there's definitely some a kind of subconscious xenophobia to what they say. Because mm. it, they act, they word it in a way like it's somehow, somehow the the fact that it's um, you know uh, a predominantly English government doing all this stuff to them that that somehow makes it worse. The fact that it's you know a Scot, you know, uh, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. That somehow uh. that makes it worse just because it's not a Scottish government fucking them over. Yeah, no, I can I can definitely see that. Well, I suppose the Scottish, but this could also be said of the Welsh, of people in the north of England. People are sick of everything being centralised for so long. Um, but, right, the Scottish have had their own parliament for a while. The Welsh have had their own assembly for a while, and England is becoming trying to become less centralised. But there is a sort of inverted snobbery in a way towards London. I think. Well, yeah, I guess, and that that's all. Well, I mean, just to, it, that that's the thing in the UK, class is, like, economic class is so heavily associated with accents, which is yeah. why I get called a posh twat all the time. Well, not all the time, mm -hmm. but I've had it enough that I just want to, I, I just want to punch people who say that to me. And I've had the reverse as well. I've had, especially from my own family. Yeah. It's just, oh. it just fucks me off big time. Good, good. Let the hate flow. Through. <laughs> At least you're not a southern pont like me. <laughs> Indeed. Okay, and goodbye uh, to this week's guests from Yorkshire, Gunson. Bye bye. And Bill. Yeah, Thulu for Targan. Uh, yeah. And uh, good night from me, Alex. This has been London after midnight. Good band. <laughs>